Well, good afternoon. Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 30th DEM I Wonder webinar. DEM has so many services, offerings, programs, and hidden gems that we want to share with all of you. So we're excited to take just a few minutes each week to highlight these features in our weekly webinar. The Utah Division of Emergency Management is hosting this webinar series aimed at providing local emergency managers with relevant content and opportunities to enhance their capabilities. Webinars are live for Q&A and recorded for later viewing on the DEM website and YouTube channel. Most of these webinars are seminars or workshops with hands-on portions, which will allow emergency managers to become oriented to a DEM process or test a DEM product. So our schedule today will be as follows. We will start with our ground rule, rules and etiquette. And next, we'll have a brief presentation by John Cross on un, unreinforced masonry buildings. Following the presentation, there will be a hands-on portion where participants will be encouraged to test out the product or process that was presented. Following the hands-on portion of our program, the presenter will be available for a Q&A session. Following the Q&A, we will close with a short message about upcoming webinars. So the ground rules today are fairly simple. If you'll please mute your lines while the presenter is presenting. If you have a question, you may type it into the group chat or unmute at the appropriate time to ask your question. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website for future viewing. Thank you all for the attendance today. And with that, I will turn the time over to John and let him present. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate this. I'd like to thank Chris Rep and Jeff Frankham for allowing me to present on this. This is a topic that I consider very important and uh, I'm just glad to be able to present. I uh, have a lot of material. I'm gonna try to go through it quickly. And if anything, I hope that people can take from this presentation what it is and maybe follow up and, and read this Wasatch Front Unreinforced Masonry Risk Reduction Strategy at a later date. It's about 115 pages, but I wanted to talk briefly about it and what we do. And um, I wanted to just talk about emergency management a little bit. Um, basically in emergency management, we're right in the middle of everything. And I think that that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's uh, watched Saturday Night Live before, and um, you've seen the, uh, you know, the skit with Dora Downer where, you know, everything is unhappy that she talks to. So I think that sometimes when we talk to emergency managers, sometimes, you know, if we go to a barbecue and we start talking work, people get a little depressed at some of the things that we discuss. But disasters change everything. And uh, I, I think it's really a great opportunity for people to go out and work disasters when they happen in your own state. We also have opportunities to go out with the Emergency Management Assistance Compact and help other states with their disasters. I went to one in Mississippi and that was Hurricane Katrina. And I want to say that disasters change everything and they also change everyone that participates with them. And I did not take any pictures the whole time I was there. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why. I, I did come back and I wrote a report and it was a two or three page report. And I tried to get a very uh, detailed report so that other people could you know, learn and know what I went through as an emergency manager where I was helping the state of Mississippi. Chris Rep was uh, there and she actually read the report and gave me some great feedback on it. And so, you know, I, I think that as emergency managers, um, you know, we have to be engaged and we have to understand and, and get the whole picture. And sometimes we have to use imagination. If we can't be at a disaster, we learn about the disaster, we read about it. And uh, just briefly on uh, Mississippi, you know, that was, the worst thing I had ever seen in my life. Um, that disaster was horrible. Uh, I was assigned to Jackson, Mississippi, the capital, and um, you know the disaster was everywhere. It reached the whole state and everybody was affected. And um, I was even able to go down to the coast and see the destruction there. It looked worse than any war zone I'd ever seen. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever you know, been uh, confronted with some of the disasters and you've seen some of the awful things that happen in disasters, but I saw it all and it affected me deeply. And um, I, I actually saw death and destruction. I smelled death and destruction and it's one of the worst things ever. And uh, it profoundly changed me. So 
that kind of um, encourages me to, you know, realize that what I do with emergency management can save life, property, environment, and commerce. And I want to talk about uh, a threat and an opportunity that we have today. This is the uh, this is a photo here of uh, Bell's Canyon. This segment is the this is the Salt Lake segment of the Wasatch Fault. This is Bell's Canyon. You can see the Wasatch Fault right there. It's a line, and you can see the series of earthquakes that have happened. There's actually lines across the fault, and I think this is one of the best demonstrations of the risk that we have today. If you can just use your imagination, and I mean, we're a long distance away, and you can see a lot of different segments of the earthquakes that have happened over the years. Um, this is also, this is the Wasatch Fault. This is a segment, if you look up on the, in the center towards the right, there's a little red dot there. That's a six foot man standing. So this was a major study that they conducted along the Wasatch Fault. And these trench studies are what the geologists are able to use in the seismologist review. And we can determine, you know, frequency of earthquakes, how often they've happened. And um, so these studies allow us to know that there's a, a significant risk in Utah. And I, I just wanted to talk, I'm not going to go through and give a lot of descriptions about the fault and the science and everything, but when there's an earthquake, you know, you have the epicenter, that line that goes straight up with the star, that's where the majority of the energy is released and then it, it goes out from there. So we have all the study that we've looked at. So uh, the Wasatch Front Unreinforced Masonry Risk Reduction Strategy was a a cooperative effort from a lot of people. We had state, federal, local officials involved with it, private sector people involved, and uh, a large variety of professions. We had engineers and seismologists, emergency managers, and educators, uh, planners, a lot of different people participated in this program. We Back in 2019, we had a URM conference here in Salt Lake City, and we had 120 attendees, more or less, and uh, that's what started this whole unreinforced masonry strategy. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So what we have here, this is a building, this is a stick frame home, and if you look here, you can see that there are metal straps that are connected to the foundation. That is a modern building code requirement. So what happens now if we have an earthquake, uh, wood is flexible, uh, it can bend and it can be pliable and it can be fastened to the foundation. And that's pretty good construction. You know, a, a structure like this would withstand a magnitude seven earthquake pretty well. This picture here is, this is just a, a cross section of a URM, an unreinforced masonry building. So you, you see the roof on top, you see the, the floor fastened to the brick, and then you see the foundation and the footing there. And, um, a lot of these roofs that you see, the roof, it's not even fastened to the masonry, it's just gravity held. So these are not the best, safest buildings. And um, here's, I just wanted to show, here's a picture of one. And uh, here's, you know, some examples of a URM with, with minor shaking, moderate shaking, the 5.7 we had in Magna, in Magna Utah, uh, that was a, a moderate earthquake. And then we have strong shaking. So you can see uh, these URMs would not do well. This was uh, in New Zealand. These are all URM buildings in New Zealand and they did not fare well. And this was not even a seven earthquake, it was a six. And I wanted to point out some of the destruction that can happen. These URMs, they can fall on people, sidewalks, buildings, cars, uh, they can interrupt everything. You can see what a mess this is. And, um, you know, we don't have to go through a magnitude seven earthquake to learn what's going to happen to us if we have one. We can just look at other places. I want to point out uh, Wells, Nevada, they had an earthquake, um, you know, and here's the downtown. Look at how beautiful it is. It just, it's a nice little town. Uh, look, notice the American flag on that building that they have there. That's a brick wall as well. This is after their six earthquake and you'll notice that every building is damaged severely, except for that flag that they have on the, uh, that American flag was the only wall that didn't have damage. I think that's fun to point out, but uh, that was not a good thing that happened. And uh, this is kind of a warning shot to the rest of us. Uh, 
you know, 140,000 URMs along the Wasatch Front, we're going to have a problem here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about disasters, why they matter. Here's just some pictures of some disasters. You know, these disasters, they can interrupt uh, supply lines, this road, you know, Public Works is responsible for fixing that. Uh, here's another one. This was the tornado in downtown Salt Lake City. We, we recall what happened there or the fatality. This is also another, this is flooding down in southern Utah, and they're trying to keep all the debris out of the, the channel so that it doesn't block up and create additional problems. I like that picture. I always put it. These, these homes were above the 100-year floodplain or the 1% special flood hazard area. They just flooded when they fell into the water. Uh, here's another fire disaster. Here's a public works building that was destroyed with a fire. This is another URM that was damaged in an earthquake in San Francisco. So this is kind of one area that I really wanted to focus on is these URMs. Um, major earthquakes are a big deal. These are not staged photos. These are actual people that are suffering with loss after an earthquake. This could be us. I want to point out that we had the scenario uh, magnitude 7 earthquake for the Wasatch Fault. This came out in 2015. And there's a lot of information in there, but the one sentence that I think is the most important one is the one that's bolded that says, Utah is not prepared for a major Wasatch Fault earthquake. I'm going to talk a little bit about why. So, you know, there's, you can see the, the, the five different segments of the Wasatch Fault, and 80% of the population in Utah lives along this fault, 75% of the economy. You look at the hazardous analysis that we have, the dark red is severe shaking, and you know the, the other, the orange and yellow, that's, that's also strong, but there's also shaking that goes clear into Wyoming and everything else. So everything on this map is uh, subject to some destruction and to some building damage. So a seven earthquake would be significant. I want to just mention a little bit about money and mitigation, the return on investment that we have. So the, there was a recent study that just came out and they were talking about building codes. For every $1 you spend on building, building codes, you're saving $11. So I don't know how everybody's 401k is doing, but if you put $1, make $11, that's fantastic. So mitigation is a great investment. Um, applying for federal grants for mitigation, for every dollar spent on that, you get a $6 return. And exceeding building codes, $1, you get $4 back. And, you know, that goes for utilities, roads, highways, railroads, and communities, and wildfires. I mean, mitigation is a win-win. <clears throat> it protects life, property, environment, and commerce. All of these are extremely important. This came from FEMA. FEMA used to discuss life, property, environment, and commerce. And I've kind of put that into my own, uh, I, 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 FEMA can't be copyrighted, so I'm taking this for my own. And I, I think that each one of these are noble aspects to protect. Multiple groups are supporting earthquake safety. Um, I, I don't have too much time to talk too much about that, but um, I also want to point out that uh, public works is also the key to recovery. Um, I wanted to point out a lot of times as public employees, when we do a great job, we don't get recognized for our efforts. But when we do a poor job, uh, everybody knows and we get criticized to high heaven. I think we've all gone through that at one point or another. This is uh, the flooding in Salt Lake City in uh, 1983. They actually did a channel and had the flood waters um, routed right through downtown Salt Lake City down State Street and they had them discharged out later. And uh, the one thing that Salt Lake City learned from this is they did capital flood improvement projects. So they went through and they improved their flood systems. They did everything right. And then in 2011, we had 10 times more snow in the mountains than average. And in 2011, uh, a lot of communities along the Wasatch Fault, it, it was actually a really good scenario. We had some cool days and then hot days and cool days and hot days, and we had a really great runoff. But in the meantime, the communities, Salt Lake City and other communities, they told all their public works people, don't take vacation. This is going to be a rough spring and a rough summer. And all the employees stayed on staff. Nobody took time off and everybody worked their hardest. And uh, we actually had more water discharge um, 
in 2011 than we did in 1983 with this. So, you know, kudos, kudos to Salt Lake City and other communities that uh, really worked hard to mitigate disaster. And by the way, when we have an earthquake, it uh, it's going to be significant. It's going to be everybody working. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about growth and vision and, you know, the pioneers arrived here in 1847, but the pioneers are generally recognized as everybody that arrived before the Transcontinental Railroad in 1847. Here's a painting of the first settlers and they have shovels out there and this is what they're doing. They're making clay adobe bricks. And what they did with this is they took clay and they mixed it with straw and they sun baked these adobe bricks. And within four and a half short months, they had uh, over 700 homes and structures built uh, you know, before the winter. So anyway, uh, these clay adobe bricks, these, this was the precursor to our problem with um, the URM problem that we have today. And they were not aware, the settlers were not aware of the uh, earthquake risk that Utah had. So they did the best with what they had. And they built a community and a state. And, uh, you know, to their credit, I think there's over 200 of these structures that still stand in one form or another. I don't know if they're all you know, just, uh, you know, usable or anything, but there's over 200 of those original 700 structures that still exist. So I wanted to point that out. Later, later those were changed to uh, fire kiln bricks and, you know, fire kiln bricks were, were great. Uh, they, they had a lot of great benefits. That's what we had here. And uh, a lot of our state was built with URMs. So I want to talk about growth real quick. We think of growing and shedding as growth. There's another aspect of leveraging, and leveraging includes vision. I'm going to give the definition, the second definition, the ability to think about or plan for the future with imagination and wisdom. And this is what we've got to use with the URM risk. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through this pretty quick. We had we Utah and our country has benefited from vision from people in the past. 1861, they connected the telegraph in Salt Lake City from coast to coast, and they connected it right here in Utah. Then um, in 1865, they had the Civil War. We needed to recover that uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the documents to start the Transcontinental Railroad. And then May 10th, 1869, they connected the railroads to the east and west in Promontory, Utah. So they had a vision for the future that united the nation and that uh, really helped our nation, you know, recover from a, an awful civil war and become united. And that happened right here. We've benefited from that. Um, 18, or I'm sorry, uh, 1969, the University of Utah started, was one of the four nodes that started the Arapanet, which is the precursor to the internet. And my point is we've um, had a lot of vision in our state and in our country. And the question that I have is, do we cultivate vision for addressing our URM threat? So, you know, our the, the original settlers that came here had a vision for making Utah home and inclusive for everybody. Do we have a vision for addressing this threat? Um, I talked about who was involved a little bit with this strategy and just leave it be that there were a lot of different people and a lot of different professions that were involved. And uh, I want to talk about this just a little bit. We have a 43% chance of a 6.75 or greater earthquake in the next 50 years. And a magnitude 7 along, earthquake along the Salt Lake City segment of the Wasatch Fault, it, will, it could have up to 2,750 fatalities and up to 10,000 serious injuries requiring hospitalization and 78,000 displaced households. <clears throat> and just, you know, just a little bit of review uh, a URM it's basically a, a brick building without reinforcement metal reinforcement and um, this is the question we know those URMs are dangerous we know they're not good and we're at a fork in the road today uh, do we have the vision to protect life property environment and commerce for the future we may be protecting ourselves we may be protecting people later but do we have the vision to address this I certainly hope so we demonstrated vision. I want to point out that Utah is an important state in the country. We are the crossroads of the West. We have railroads going through, uh, highways going through, air travel. Um, the region is dependent on Utah. 
and uh, we're connected to the west rest of the United States. If we don't react and follow up with, with earthquake preparedness, we're going to have a mess. And it's not just going to put Utah in a mess, it's going to put the region and the country in a mess as well. We really need to address this and look at this seriously. Uh, where can I find the Wasatch Front Unreinforced Masonry Risk Reduction Strategy? Jeff Frankham is going to provide the link to that. You can also Google that. Any search engine will find it. You can also ask me and I'll email you the link to it. Just 115 pages. I want to talk about this URM uh, strategy a little bit. We, have, we basically came up with five phases. The first phase was to define uh, and properly identify URM buildings. We've kind of done that. We, we know there's 140,000 of those along the Wasatch Front. The second phase was to validate and prioritize URM buildings, and uh, that's in the process too. Phase three is develop and uh, refine and retrofit options and different requirements. And then phase five is we define the implementation and we build the budget to fix it. Phase five is you do it. And I'd like to point out that we have a lot of those that have already been going on. The temple in uh, downtown Salt Lake City is going through a significant seismic retrofit right now. They're going through a state-of-the-art uh, base isolation system that's going to protect that building for future generations. <clears throat> Pardon me. The uh, Salt Lake City International Airport's going through a rebuild, and that airport is amazing. They have built that to seismic standards to withstand a magnitude seven, and they're they're planning on that, op that airport being operable within 48 hours of major earthquake, the magnitude seven. So there's good things and there's lots of projects going on throughout the state already, but we still have these 140,000 uh, URMs. There's a few other things that come up in the strategy. Uh, they so We all suggested to have a state resilience officer and have that be independent and, and charged with broad responsibility to coordinate and direct the state's resilience efforts. Uh, assess the vulnerabilities that we have. And um, anyway, I wanted to go on to the con conclusion on this. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for some questions. This is my contact uh, information, uh, my cell number, and my email, jcrofts at utah.gov. And with that, I would like to open it up if there's anybody that has some questions. There's some comments. Wade mentioned that he, he was on. Oh, hey, there you have. Go ahead, Wade. What did I, what did I mention? Well, I was, the, your Fox News. Oh yeah, that yeah, I was just uh, the right the uh, tornado situation. Yeah, I was just uh, producing the noon newscast at Fox 13 when all of a sudden the just newsroom went crazy with reports of a tornado going downtown. Uh, my question actually though is uh, for John on the um, prediction whatever as far as the Wasatch fault. Um, the chances for the future. I think we're, we use the terminology of 6.0 or greater, but I think, isn't there a maximum of uh, magnitude potential on the Wasatch Fault? I mean, when we say greater, yes. I mean, greater could go up to, like there's nines and 10 magnitude quakes around the world, but we don't really yeah. know. Yeah, right? great question, Wade. I'm so glad you asked that, thank you. Yes, um, so when we had the magnitude 5.7 earthquake in Magna, there was, uh, email that went out and it just went like wildfire and it was telling everybody to brace themselves because we would have a magnitude nine earthquake following that which is just impossible because we don't live in the ring of fire we don't have subduction zones where the tectonic plates meet to have an earthquake that's as big as a nine you'd need you'd need that so utah has a normal fault um we just have a fault so the maximum earthquake that Utah could have would be in the magnitude seven range. So if, if we could not have a, a magnitude nine, which is great because magnitude nine earthquake would be horrific. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That was that was really kind of a, a moment of panic for a lot of people because a fight, there's a big, big difference between a magnitude 5.7 and a nine. Um, so yeah, thank you, Wade, great question. I think Mark, ahead, Mark has a question. Yeah, can you hear me? 
Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, I, I attended a Ned Division Natural Resources training here several years ago, and I knew I was in trouble when the title of the class had the word quaternary in it. And I still don't know that I know what that is. But um, one of the things that I learned in this, and I, I asked the question, oops, sorry, I got a phone ringing here, um, was that we have these different segments. And a lot of times we keep talking about the Wasatch Front, you know, the Wasatch Fault, and then be and, and, but we got to really be mindful of the segments because I asked him, I says, so as you smart people who read dirt, um, look at this here, has the entire Wasatch Fault ever unzipped at the same time? And they says it's never happened. Now, I don't mean it couldn't, you know, but the, but the reality is, is, is that when we look at this, it, it goes in segments. So if you have a particular segment hit, you, you know, that one obviously will have its its impacts as well as maybe the neighboring segments as it kind of radiates out. But so to me, that's kind of good news in the fact that if the Brigham City segment goes real bad, you know, I mean, Weber County is going to fill it, Cache County is going to fill it, but there's a good chance that, that we can send cavalry out of Salt Lake and Utah counties to help us, you know, and, and vice versa, you know. Uh, so I, I think it's important to kind of keep that perspective in mind. At least that, that was a big paradigm shift for me to understand it. You know, the, the odds of having a complete unzip from Brigham City to, to Payson it just is highly unlikely. And, that, and that's good news for us, right? Yeah, Mark, what a, you know, I, I love talking to you, Mark, because you're always engaged with things and understanding you know, how things are going. And um, yeah, the so we have five segment, five active segments along the Wasatch Fault. We we do have the Box Elder segment, and um, if you go to that scenario document that I referred to, that can be find found on the Utah Seismic Safety Commission, or I can email it to anybody that wants. But um, the the box elder segment is overdue for a, a, a magnitude seven earthquake. So you haven't had one in a while, and um, in fact, there's all the seismologists agree that right now there's significant stress. There's, there's adequate stress along each one of the segments right now that we could have a magnitude seven along any of the of the five segments. And you know that goes from you know the the segments range from southern Utah, the Box Elder some uh, Box Elder segment clear down to the south, which goes down to Laban. So, uh, yeah, you know those those five segments, you know they it, they they are you know separate segments of the fault, and you know they can sometimes you know go in conjunction with each other. You could have an earthquake that goes along with them, but they are right. Um, you know when they they go back and they do those trench studies and they they look at all the different studies they you know sometimes it's hard to go back in geology they can estimate kind of about when when it happened but you know they use you know the best projections and estimates but they can also see when each one of the segments has has uh slipped and they're they they do not always go off together and you know it doesn't mean if one segment goes off that all of them will and the seismologist was correct when they said they don't usually work in tandem all together at once. But if there is a big earthquake in uh, the box other segment, you know, the other areas of the Wasatch Front will be able to respond and help. So, yeah, great question. Although if if you do have a, a magnitude seven earthquake up there, Mark, the rest of us are going to fill it and have damage as well. So great question. Thanks. Mark, do you have more to say? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, first off, I'm going to say well, we voted not to have one. Okay, so just so that you know <laughs> that. So we're going to we're going to postpone that for a few thousand years. But um, if I'm not mistaken, the the largest recorded in whatever kind of history they've got is was actually in Hansel Valley out here in Box Elder County. I think it was a six point eight, wasn't it? Yeah. See, Mark, you're right. Yep. I'd have to look back and see what year that was, but that was just pretty recent that wasn't too long ago so yeah um and no, I think if you go back and look at the geology uh if in that scenario document that we have uh the scenario document also has you know we, we've had several magnitude sevens throughout history so if you look at it from a geologic standpoint uh the wasatch fault is a very active fault so uh, it's the largest fault in the state of utah I think, did I cut somebody off? I heard somebody talking. I didn't mean to interrupt. Was somebody well, talking? It was, was that you, Mark? It was me interrupting. I apologize. I was just going to say that Hansel Valley quake was 1934 and it was 6.5. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. 
Any other questions? Yeah, hey, Craig Howe in the comments, and I hope I said that last name right, but he says, can you address liquef liquefaction? Did I say that right, John? Yeah, liquefaction yeah. zones, yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the Utah Geologic Survey has a map and they that has all the um liquefaction zones in the state and you know we have a lot of those maps i, I guess to say you know when we have a map of the faults we, we're always discovering new faults and, and everything so uh, the geologic survey does have um and let me just explain a little bit of on what liquefaction zones are so basically when the soil loses cohesion cohesion you know when they're shaking the uh, soil can actually turn into like a liquid state. So if you have soft soils, they can bubble up. Um, that's kind of bad for, you know, foundations. And, you know, if you have septic tanks, sometimes just the principle of buoyancy will lift the septic tank right out of the, the ground. And um, liquefaction is a threat to buildings and structures. Uh, you know, the Salt Lake City Airport, that's built in a, liqui a high liquefaction area. And uh, they spent so much uh, effort and time and work in engineering to mitigate that liquefaction out there. They have these pilings, uh, thousands of pilings down there to protect the airport in, in the case of an earthquake. So liquefaction, um, typically it occurs in areas that have uh, you know, soft sands and, and areas like that. In the magnitude 5.7 earthquake, there was some liquefaction. Um, the geologic, Utah's geologic uh, survey, DNR, they actually have a website that you can go and, and look at some of the pictures of liquefaction. And you also, there's also some pictures that, you know, in New Zealand, they had a lot of liquefaction where, you know, they have cars that actually sunk down into the soil, the, the soil lost its cohesion and they, they actually sunk like a rock down into the dirt. So liquefaction's great uh, for, well, I, I guess it's awful, but, it's really an interesting um, occurrence that happens in earthquakes where, you know, things lose their, it, it loses the, the strength. So the soil that you're standing on can actually perform more like a liquid, it, you know, and I, I think that people have demonstrated that before when they have something vibrant, they put, you know, a plastic toy on a, a, a bed of sand and they put a vibration device and the sand basically liquefies and the toy car sinks. So liquefaction is an issue that we deal with. And then with a magnitude seven earthquake, uh, we would have quite a bit of that. Great point, thanks. And, you know, I'd be glad to address that more with people after, if you want to talk to me after, or, you know, contact me later. Yeah, that was a good question. Good information. Um, Kimberly Giles asked if we've got a map of the, you know, the state with that. And I know you had one in your, your PowerPoint showing where that went, just. But is there one that you know that people can have access to to see where the fault lines and all that run? Uh, yes. So we have those maps on the on the scenario report, which I showed in my in my presentation. Um, you can just Google Utah Seismic Safety Commission, and um, there is, that document and all the maps included in that are. Uh, downloadable right on a PDF. I think everybody's seen our purple putting down roots publication as well. We also have maps in there. Uh, I really like the maps that we have in that. That publication is actually going through a review right now and we're going to have that updated as well to include the magnet earthquake and a, a few other interesting facts and information to be involved with that. Great question, Kimberly. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, John. Appreciate Thank it. You. Great information. So as a reminder, this webinar and all our other webinars in the series will be available on the DEM website at dem.utah.gov slash exercises or now at dem.utah.gov slash I wonder. So our next webinar will be held August 19th. Angela Lang will be our presenter and she'll be discussing organizing and updating emergency plans. Um, to close out, if any of you ever have have an I wonder topic suggestion that we, we would you'd like for us to talk about if you'd reach out to me and send an email to Jeff Frankum at utah.gov we can add your topic to our calendar 
Um, we're always excited to help you explore and get to know all the DEM can offer in the emergency management community. And so until next time, keep wondering.